congratulate all the speakers that came before me. They did an excellent job this morning. And I'd also like to thank the light and sound crew and the backstage crew and the house attendants for working hard for us this morning. They did an excellent job. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. In 1988, Dallas County Judge Jack Hampton was quoted in the New York Times when asked why he gave a lenient sentence to the convicted killer of two gay men, Tommy Trimble and Johnny Griffin. The judge responded, I equate the killing of a homosexual with that of a prostitute. I would never sentence anyone to life in jail for killing a prostitute. Later in that same article, William Wayborn, then president of the Dallas Gay Alliance, was quoted as saying that violence against homosexuals is a very common occurrence for high school age boys here in Dallas, Texas. Mr. Wayborn was right. Violence against homosexuals is a common occurrence for high school age students here in Dallas, Texas. And it's not something relegated to the near or distant past. In 2012, there were 44 reported hate crimes in Dallas and Tarrant County, making the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex the nation leader in hate crimes. And you might be asking yourself, why is this important to this young man? And the truth is, I went to school with and grew up with the six boys that participated in the killing of Mr. Trimble and Mr. Griffin. More importantly, I too have committed hate crimes in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. My name is Jason Carney. I'm a poet, educator, and activist. And my big idea is that America, more specifically white America, needs to have an honest conversation with itself about race. My honest conversation began in July of 1988 when I was placed in Green Oak Psychiatric Hospital on the other side of the city. My roommate was a gay man who was dying of AIDS. He could have hated me for everything that I stood for. Everything that I encompassed, the way I hated him for everything that he stood for, everything about who he was. But he didn't. He extended to me a simple act of kindness. He showed me how poetry could redefine my world, how through writing and inventory, I could replace the beliefs that I was raised with. See, beliefs are outside of you. They're someone else's prayer. But knowledge, that's inside of you. That's how you know the truth when you hear it. You know the truth when you see it. You know the truth when you feel it. And I... I began to ask questions that led to truthful answers, like the way I equated homosexuality to what my father used to do to me. More specifically, I equated homosexuality with sex, molestation, and rape. And that's not homosexuality at all. See, Patrick showed me that the love between two men is no different than the love between a man and a woman, that the emotional bond is the guiding force in any relationship. I began to understand these things when I saw through poetry how other people lived, like this poem I wrote for Patrick. We found ourselves in the bleeding horror of our veins, ripped open from glass shards, stabbing frenzies of fear. This is a world where there is no justice in being the survivor. Only the burned in scars of a lover's ropes to your disease, bleeding lesions, tattooed like yesterday's to your arms, back, and legs. Yesterday's for you that ran out of tomorrow's. Yet, somehow you found the serene knowledge that you would die alone away from the scornful size of a society that brands you with queer man's illness. You see, ignorance has a name, but you never offered that name to me. Only the outstretched twist of a tongue, the probing touch of a thought, you intellectually challenged my closed-eyed, naive sexuality. You reformed me from blindness, from wearing that name of ignorance, from being a beater of men, of men like you, and punishing myself with the blood of others until the purging sounds of your all-too-familiar emotional tears muffled pleased through the snot-soaked sheets. I still shiver from the weight of insomnia, the room's terror field, shadows of darkness beating you down like rain drizzling off a cracked window pane, past betrayals and patient trickles and the flailing hatred of the transparent loved ones laden in the walls. I cried when you left, and you kissed me through the sounds of your dissipating footsteps or turning you to the glimmering breasts of nightclubs, drag queens, unsafe sex and booze. You only knew one way to live, and it was in that life that I found you. It was in that life that I found you. The shades of your skin, that disgruntled sound of forgiveness that made me want to live again. I lost, I discovered virtue, repentance through words, humble movements are atoning and you move in me now, floating under a heavy cloud, a sleeping smoke, a trance-like state where I saw the colors of your breast swirling on an infinite quilt as anonymous mothers are stitched together by the common, ignored passings of their sons. And you, Patrick, you should not be common any longer. I will inhale the vibrance of your name, shrouded in a whispering kiss between two men's entangled air, the closeness of being friends found on each other's mouths, open in this wordful search for sanity. I see your eyes and his voice ascending past the self or hell ghost of God guilt, and I know that demons of past lives will end with a word. And so I use poetry to begin defining myself and redefining my beliefs, replacing them with some knowledge. And I began to see that ra uh, racial slurs had been a part of my rhetoric since I was four or five years old, and that's how we teach hate in this country, through anecdotes 
and story, through love and smiles, family gatherings, generation to generation. And once I began to start analyzing my family, I came to this truth, and that is if we don't know the truth of where we come from, if we don't honestly know where we've been, we're never going to know where we're at, and we're never going to get it to where it is we want to go. So I started using poetry to analyze where my family had been. My southern heritage lies in the smell of June. It was my mamaw. She was half chalk tall, half snuff, half crazed by the spirit of the wind, giving her since she called the touch. She could see things, catch a firefly with her tongue. She'd rub the swollen fluorescence of their bellies to my forehead, a good vision on my birthday, and she always told me I would grow to be a man that knew life by the way it felt, that when I walked in the wandering reflection of dreams, I should stand strong and tall as Papaw, because he was a man who knew life by the way it felt, and his heart was in my eyes, his soul within my breath. My southern heritage lies in their simplicity. Poverty, faith. Baseball games on an old AM radio and the closeness of a family sharing Sunday supper. My southern heritage was Sundays. Baptist revivals. Deep voices from the choir urging me to go tell it on the mountain because Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I love that old hymn. But I can't think about those fond memories of childhood anymore without seeing through the pessimism of these eyes which are of a man. And I have to ask myself what kind of truth those old white southern Baptists found on those mountaintops. Why couldn't they hear the voices dangling from the branches of the elms, the dead that had been peeled away into the forgotten generation after generation, wounds that buried themselves under our skin, woven into our bones, all because they were silent, practiced it, turning their heads. See, we're the threads of rope that pulled James Byrd to his death on the back roads of Jasper, Texas, less than 200 miles from where we stand, ignorance reigns. My southern heritage spends centuries of time where people are silent, practiced it, turning their heads. It boils under my skin when my eyes don't have heart, when my soul's not in my breast. See, if I'm to grow to be that man that knows life by the way it feels, then these lessons got to be mine to see the truth of and find the responsibility to teach to my little girl. Because I don't want her southern heritage to lie in the shades of her skin. She's half Thai. Half Irish, Choctaw, and snuff. She was speaking multicultural phrases combining Thai, Laotian, and Hick. Sabadi ka, y'all. And I'm going to catch fireflies with my tongue. Rub the swollen fluorescence of their bellies to her forehead. A good vision on her birthday. Well, she will travel amongst the dead and learn the lessons of their lives. Spill the dust of stars and planets. Exist in the deepest reaches of the mind. She will tell a truth on that mountaintop that she won't succumb to the wounds of her bones. She will not be silent. And she won't ever be practiced at turning her head. I love that poem, right? I love talking about my mamma and talking about my papa. That's where I come from. That's where I begin. But I have to look at my ancestors in an honest way. My papa was a great man. He taught me a lot about family, what it means to work hard, to sacrifice, how to truly love a woman. But he also referred to every black man that I ever saw him talk to as boy, with the exception of Muhammad Ali and Hank Aaron. He also tore the cover off the TV guide whenever Red Fox or uh, George Jefferson was on the cover. And my family likes to say, well, you know, Papa, he came from a different time. And I think that excuse is a cop-out. It denies us taking ownership of our past actions. It denies us culpability in the retelling of history. And we need to have culpability as we talk to our young about history. It is true. My Papa did come from a different time. And as a young man, he lived on the side of a hill in Arkansas that was so named for all the lynchings that took place there on the weekends. It is true. As a young girl, my grandmother remembers watching horse-drawn carts go up the side of the hill so that loved ones could go retrieve the dead. It is true. They came from a different time. But not that different. James Byrd, Matthew Shepard, the 43 shots that killed Amadou Lialo in a New York City apartment building. Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown, he came from a different time. This is an excuse that white people can use to deny their own culpability in the retelling of the past. It's no different than politically correct rhetoric of today like black on black crime and black on white crime. And when we feel like being lenient and we got to give a second chance, we always have white collar crime. But we never discuss white on black crime crime. Think about inheritance. We like to inherit things from our ancestors like money, popularity, prestige, land, but we don't ever want to inherit their flaws. And history repeats itself when we refuse to learn. And we deflect ownership of our past by inventing rhetoric like 
I never owned any slaves, and I've got lots of black friends. White people say some of the stupidest things. We like to sugarcoat the past, water it down, so that the genocide within our textbooks seems patriotic. Have you ever studied the North Atlantic Trade Triangle? How about the Trail of Tears? We need to hold conversations in our classrooms that spill over into the lives of our students. See, my papa used to call me a prize fighter, and I never understood what that meant until I started fighting with poetry. The more I wrote, the more I engaged in civic duty, the more I held conversations with critically-minded people that challenged the status quo, the more I understood the way we water down and sugarcoat our history. We've got to hold conversations with students that are challenging and engaging to them. And today I am a prize fighter. I run a nonprofit here in Dallas called Young DFW Riders, and we go into high schools and we challenge young people to be agents of change, not only within the DFW Metroplex, not only within their own communities, not only within their own school, not within their own families, but beginning with their own lives. We challenge them to redefine themselves so the world won't define them. One thing I know is if you don't take time to define yourself, the world will define you, and those definitions are very, very limiting. So we teach kids to hold open conversations with themselves and with their peers so that they can put definitions on them that are limitless and so that they might grow through a focused artistic endeavor. We teach old school American poetics with new school American poetics, meaning we teach Robert Frost right alongside LL Cool J. And I gotta tell you, LL Cool J is much more technically proficient at rhyming than Robert Frost ever was, right? <laughs> So we try to have fun when we educate kids. We try to blend the old school with the new school, like Lottie Dottie, Lottie Dottie, we likes to potty, we don't cause trouble, we don't bother nobody, we just some kids that are on the mic, and when we rock up on the mic, we rock the mic right. For all in y'all, keeping y'all in here, just to have a time and enjoy yourself, because it's cool when we cause a cozy condition, and that's what we create, that's our mission, so listen to what we say, because this type of stuff happens every day. White America. Who we are isn't hidden, it's cumbersome like regret, evoked like a photograph, motionless and grainy, black and white, steel frame, picture, postcard, a lynchings. Sound in the blood, the smell of fire, fingerprints burned off bodies, hung from trees, nailed to poles, lynched like animals. Hatred, it's as silent as the fangs that bring it form to a stone. This is American truth, timeless, inescapable. Justice, never needed guilt. Running down a trip brick alley, pissing himself like a scared dog. Froggy James was beaten, stabbed, hung, and shot. Had half his burnt head stuck on a stake in an Illinois city park. How many ways we got to kill a man before we take his dignity? What's more vulgar? The hooded secret gatherings at the back roads or the picnics at the town squares. White families wearing their Sunday's best to choir, a timely hats and a revival of baseball bats. Open bellies, fresh meat sandwiches, and drug from a courthouse just after lunch. Jesse Washington was a thick black flesh cloud of human smoke as proper children poked his death with a curious stick. Here it is, Laura Nielsen, hanging from a bridge next to her 15-year-old son. See, they accused that woman of stealing, so they raped her. Gave her salvation by letting her ripple the tips of her toes against the clandestine surface of the water. She looked so peaceful, escaping our ancestors' claws. Here it is, Mary Turner, hung upside down at eight months pregnant, split along the gut. Here it is like an umbilical cord dangling an unwinding backbeat, but Mary's child made no sound, crushed under the heel of a boot. It knew not a begging, only that blistered voices tattered with hate sing with the lushness of a blood out bruise. And the Georgia backwoods, sweating with the salvation of hymnals. You can almost hear those ghosts singing the chariots. They ain't so damn sweet when you meet them running. Dirt roads are cold places to die. So here it is, these photographs, picture postcards of lynchings, sounding like America, sounding like gurgles of death, a perverse call of freedom shot through the mouth of Memphis where dreams deferred is the blood we wipe on our shirt and carry as pilgrim to a new distortion, sounding like gurgles of death. But the blood on our street, that's the coldness of our memory. So here it is, not to be forgotten. But we don't know how many people have died in this land at the hands of racist laughter, equality, muffled underneath our laughter and the right to death is given so freely. From the 1840s, Negro men who were force-fed coke as backs broke from long hours and no pay on the banks of the mighty Mississippi to the way crack crumbles to start us under the way to handgun freedom. 450 blind-eyed years, white folks silent, running from this drug to torture, not much changing. Two out of three juveniles sentenced to death in this land are American children of color. 
not much changing. One in five black men on death row were convicted by an all-white jury, not much changing. In the great state of Texas, if you're black, you're five times more likely to get the death penalty for killing a person that's white. Lynch mobs, they ain't dead. They become the inalienable scales of justice. This is American truth. Hatred, it's as silent as those that turn their eyes to it. Silence is guilty as the fact there ain't no difference between Laura Nielsen hanging from that bridge or whatever young jail black youth you see on the news. This is America, a perverse call of freedom like fingerprints burned off bodies like a faint gurgle strapped to a table like laughter singing and not much changing going on around here. See that poem, it speaks to a history that repeats itself from the vagrancy laws of post-Civil War America and the rise of the KKK to the mandatory sentence of the crack cocaine epidemic of the mid-1980s and the 800% growth rate of our prisons. From the Japanese internment camps of World War II to the Muslim roundups in the wake of 9-11. From the generalization and stereotypes of Mark Twain's characters to Darley Routier and Susan Smith, white America creates feared caricatures, not only of black men and black women, but also Latinos, homosexuals, and women. White America segregates itself and preaches about freedom. We like to hold up the idea of Christian value while we deny other people the right to marry and openly love. We lock up black men, and yet we appropriate black culture. We want to protect borders in cities such as El Paso, Las Cruces, and Los Angeles from the same people who founded them. White America needs to have an honest conversation with itself because we segregate ourselves and we talk about freedom. My name's Jason Carney. I use poetry to change my life and the world around me, and I thank you for being part of this honest conversation. Yeah.